another episode of Cryptid Ramblers. I'm Scott in beautiful South End, and across from me is the beast from Basildon himself, Callum. <laughs> hello, How hello. Doing, mate? Very well. Glad to be back. <laughs> Can't believe we're at episode three. I know, right? Episode mm. three. Who would have thought I it? Didn't think we'd get past one. No, but, I didn't think we'd yeah, get as far as recording one. <laughs> yeah. I said this last episode. We're going to say it every episode. Yeah, after no doubt. As well. So just get used to that, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> episode, uh, we're going to be staying in 1960s West Virginia and taking a look at the Mothman of Point Pleasant um, and also potentially the Mothman of 9-11 and the Mothman of Chernobyl. So absolutely. That's really interesting. Mm. Um, although before we do, I do want to apologise to everyone listening and to you, Callum, um, if I sound tired or slow or sluggish. <laughs> More so than um, usual. <laughs> what? Yeah, I didn't get to sleep last night, mate. Right, um, okay. Turns out we've actually we've got a squirrel in the loft. Or, yeah. <laughs> right. Do you know, I honestly thought you were going to make a moth pun. <laughs> no, no, this bloody thing. It, was, it kept, kept me up all night scurrying around. <laughs> right, like, okay. It did me nothing. Hey, oh, very good. There he is. <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You know, you <laughs> um, but yeah, on a serious note, Thank you to everyone who has listened to our previous two episodes. And uh, thank you also for getting involved and sending us your comments, pictures, videos, and links yeah, um, on Facebook and Instagram. It's actually quite a lot of fun for us to go through those, you know, actually engage with yeah. people that have listened to the show. Absolutely. Um, another update on the socials. Um, we are on YouTube. Now we are, we are posting yes. our... Our uh, episodes on YouTube as well. We are at last, yeah. You'll be pleased to know that it is just um, audio at the moment. There is no video as such. We're not. I don't think we're quite at that point yet. If we ever will be, but uh, faces for radio. Faces absolutely, for absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a reason why it's audio only. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but yeah, it's just another platform to give people access to. If if you're a, a hardened YouTube user, I think the the main thing that we can talk about with regards to Mothman. We've got yep. to talk about the film, The Mothman Prophecies. Absolutely. Um, and I don't know about you, but I absolutely loved that film. Oh, it's a great it film. the bejesus out of me when I was, when I was younger. When I was, when I was younger, definitely. It's, it certainly, I mean, it's still, it's aged well, I think. It's carried that creep mm. factor quite superbly, really. I mean, obviously, we've both watched it more recently for the purposes of, uh, you know, of this episode, but... Um, it still brought back a lot of the points where, you know, I could remember getting the the chills and you know the hairs would stand up on end and 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 yeah, I think so. It's, it's aged well and and I think it is horrendously underrated for uh, you know for, for being a, a, a horror thriller film. Oh, absolutely! I mean, it's it, the way that film generates tension mm. and just the actual genuine horror. In a lot yeah, of definitely. Like the, I mean, the way. I mean, obviously, we know from the previous episode the way Indrid Cold was um, portrayed in the film is very, very different to how Woody Derenberger would. Oh, very different. Portrayed him to be, but mm. even still, just that that creep factor that you got from him. Just, just that, yeah, definitely. I mean, they've def they've certainly, as you know, as we'll discuss and as you'll mention, you know, no doubt soon, you know, it has been overly dramatized for the purposes of you know the film which is what you would expect from you know hollywood taking a uh you know an, a, you know events based on real stories and stuff but uh but no f f all that aside it is still you know a very very good film and for anyone listening to this who hasn't seen it i would uh highly recommend going and, and and watching it i think you can rent it on both sky and amazon prime for i think about 250 uh, I know we both bought the DVD for four pound off Amazon, but uh, I'm trying yeah. to find the Blu-ray to be honest, but I couldn't yeah, find yeah, one yeah. in English. I really, well, I think I did find one, but it was like sixteen pound from 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 Amazon, and I just thought for the purposes of oh, you know yeah. a, sort of a one-off watch, I thought the DVD was probably better value for money. But and I think it almost adds a certain I don't know a certain kind of like nostalgia to it if you watch the dvd as opposed to like the blu-ray version because of the yeah. you know the grainy picture and you know i, I don't know it just added that extra you know, creepiness to it i think because I, i'll agree with that because i've watched films that are from like the early 2000s on mm. high def and 
yeah, it's good, but it just it's just a little bit off. It loses something, I, I think. I don't know whether that's just nostalgia or or yeah, whatever. I don't know, but or oh, <laughs> yeah, technophobes, yeah. <laughs> oh, the kids don't know what VHS is, mate. Oh, they won't. They, they won't know, know the pain. They won't know the pain. Yeah, when you you didn't have to, you couldn't skip. You no, couldn't skip. you had to sit there and wait until it wound all the way back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you had to fast forward through the credits and the, the trailers and everything. Yeah. No man, no, the trailers are the best bit. <laughs> Trailers were, <laughs> but oh, won't know the struggle. But um, but yes, no, the movie. So yeah, that's go ahead. Kicked off our uh, our uh, research, really, wasn't it? It was absolutely, yeah. I'm rewatching that film, and it was. then then we actually decided to go and have a look at the book itself. Yes, and the book. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, yeah, but I was quite surprised at how different it was. Oh, I mean, I was probably more so surprised and then maybe yourself because i know i started the book a, a couple of days after um you'd already sort of read a, a few a good chunk of it um and i honestly thought like with many books that are then developed into film that it was basically just going to be a a a novel version of you know the film so i was so i almost knew what i was going to be reading but there might have been certain things that left out but no it is it's entirely entirely different which i know we've discussed it's not, no, it's more of a, I don't know, I've probably got as far as saying it's a, a memoir or, or a diary almost of, of, um, of John Kill's time in, in, in West Virginia during, during that, that period. And it's, it's, it's gripping, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm yet to finish it. Uh, I still probably got about the last third of the, the book to go. Um, but no, it's, it's vastly different to the film, which, which I think is, uh, is a good thing. And you can certainly see from, you know, reading the book, you know, to watching the film, you know, where those differences are and mm. who the characters in the film are supposed to portray from the book and, you know, and how they have dramatised it, um, you know, to such an extent. Um, I mean, both are great in their own in their own right, but um, no, they are, as you say, they are vastly different. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, I completely agree as well that obviously Hollywood has to have a certain artistic licence with what they do because... yeah. Let's be honest, not everyone's going to really be that interested in weird paranormal encounters and, and the such. And I, I suppose when it came out in 2002, that would have been the case. I mean, nowadays, the amount of stuff you on, even for just Amazon Prime. Yes, like exactly. Yeah. Trees and you know, all this, there's, there's so much out there. Yes. There's so much weirdness and high strangeness mm. out there that. To be honest, even when if they literally took the book by itself and and turned that into a documentary, yeah, I think that would have gripped so many people as well. But I think so. If it, the, the Mothman prophecies got everyone out to got it all to the masses, then didn't they? No, exactly. I think it, from what I've read, it was a um, a surprise hit in the in the box office, and and yeah, it started the whole the whole sort of folklore and then gave it the the world renowned status that it's now you know sort of seemingly got and um you know as you as you mentioned briefly earlier in the intro you know it does kind of lend you know certain influence to you know sightings in you know other quite well-known places you know around the world was obviously we'll touch on you know a bit later so it's definitely still got that even years after i think it was sort of 15 20 years or so after you know the film you know came out it's still lending itself to you know, legends and folklores and, and, and you know, and whatever else, um, and which I think just, go on. Go on. Sorry, go on. Go on. I was to say, just obviously it lends itself to, you know, the impact of the film and possibly how underrated it was that it's still, you know, to this day playing a prominent part in American folklore, uh, not, you know, not just specifically that, that region. Um, so, yeah, no, it's... Mothman, Mothman festivals that happen every year. They do, that's incredible. yeah, they do, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely incredible. It's, it's like, mad, much, much like the Bigfoot ones of, uh, you know, of, of sort of California and you know, and other parts of the Pacific Northwest. You know, they they have big, you know, Bigfoot festivals. It's, it's just mad how these, you know, these cryptids and these legends have sort of become pop, you know, pop culture, which I know we we discussed a little bit in the the last episode. Um, it's just it's mad how these sort of grip people's 
you know, imaginations, really. Well, I reckon we're going to have to start up a, a Patreon, mate, to fund us to go over. To <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely on board. I'm <laughs> definitely on board. Mate, right, we'll dress you up like Moth Man. You're about the same same sort of height. So, Chortford. We'll, we'll build you. We'll build you like some big wings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chortford. Shits and giggles. I think that'd be that'd be quite funny if it wasn't for the fact that you know the Americans, as we know, are quite loose on their gun laws. <laughs> and I and I would absolutely get shot. <laughs> Be the first captured Mothman since 1966. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Victim to a bloody cult. <laughs> a weird action. Strung up and yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So sounds a bit funny. This one, <laughs> yeah. Sounds like from Australia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How true that would be. <laughs> oh, I know, right? I know. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, we understand the, the big differences between the film and the real-life sightings of Mothman. So yes, yeah. It might be worth us getting, in, getting into the first... Yeah, first I guess the, the sort of the... Yeah, the origins of it. So, yeah, I mean, much like, um, you know, our previously covered cryptid, Mr. Indrid Cold, uh, the Mothman is also a big part of West Virginia folklore, as, you know, as, as we've mentioned. Um some of the earliest sightings, I think, date back to around 1914. Uh, but the most publicised event uh, started on November the 15th, 1966, and actually lasted just over a year until the 15th of December 1967. Um, the, the the first newspaper report was printed in the Point Pleasant Register uh, a day after the first sighting on the 16th of November 1966. Uh, again, similar to when Woodrow Derenberger was uh, invited on TV the following day after his encounter with Mr. Cold, these two events are actually only a month apart. Um, the newspaper report was picked up by National Press, which then helped it spread across the United States, which I think, much like the you know first Bigfoot encounter with Terry Crew, I think then kind of inspired many other you know states and cities around America to to then start having their own accounts you know and as we'll discuss later it stretched even further than you know than america um so the, the first sighting specifically or certainly the most publicized one uh involved two couples um roger and linda scarbury and steve and mary malley on the evening of as we've said november 15th 1966 they all told police that they saw a large gray creature whose eyes glowed red so there's that glowing red eyes reference uh Absolutely. Um, when it was picked up in their car's headlights, uh, it was also described as a, a large flying man with a 10 foot wingspan. Uh, the creature was reported to have followed their car whilst they were driving in an area outside of, of town known as the TNT area, um, which to locals is, it will know, it's the site of an old munitions factory, which again plays quite a prominent part in the, in the film. Yes. Um, in the days that followed, there were multiple sightings, which each included the same description. I, I don't mostly necessarily think it's worth going over each and every one of those, because for the most part, they're all one of the same. And I think, as you said before we recorded, Scott, they're all much of a muchness. So, yeah. uh, But this is by far the most um, sort of compelling. It's the one that kind of kick-started it all, wasn't it? So. Which, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but I'd like to make a point about them all being much of a muchness in that... Yeah. They all seem to be very similar, which could probably add a bit of credence to it. Yes, absolutely. There wasn't too much deviation from the descriptions or the area in which it was sighted and, and that kind of thing. As well. Yes, so, the behaviour as well. No, absolutely. Um, I suppose just to, you know, kind of jump in with maybe a little bit of um, uh, sort of debunking, um, you know, because again, as we want to try and do on this podcast, we want to try and be, you know, level level headed with it. We don't want to try and convince everyone of everything. Right. <laughs> we do try, but we also do want to kind of be level headed ourselves. But we do <laughs> exactly, we do try. It's a, it's a good attempt, if nothing else. Um, we also do want to try and bring in any, yeah, any theories that go against what we're, you know, trying to support or anything that may debunk the various legends and, and folklores. Um, and then, you know, and this one is is of course no different and. Uh, the, this uh, sort of account comes from uh, a local sheriff to the area, uh, Mr. George Johnson, and biologist Robert L. Smith, who both claim that the descriptions given 
by these two couples uh, specifically matched that of either a large heron or a sandhill crane. Um, these are known to stand taller than the average human or the average man, sorry, uh, with a seven foot wingspan. So you can see where they draw their, their similarities from. Um, now, until obviously reading this from, from both of these individuals, I hadn't actually known what a sandhill crane was or even what it looked like. I don't know if, if you were the same, but I certainly had to Google an image just to kind of paint the picture in my mind as to, you know, if I saw that flying over my head, would you know that it was a bird or would you be, you know, forgiven for, you know, mistaking it for well, you know, I've something I've else? Experience um, of sandhill cranes. Um... I thought you were going to say you experience with big birds, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've seen it once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, um, I'd, as, as you know, Callum, um, in like 2003, the family moved out to Orlando, Florida. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, or 2004, sorry, should I say. And it, it was um, sandhill cranes were a regular occurrence. Right, okay. Florida. Um, I, I remember the first time I actually saw one, I heard it first. And I'm not kidding, I thought it was a fucking dinosaur. Like this noise <laughs> that came out of these, the, the little reservoir lake thing outside the, outside the house. It was this, right. This noise. I'm not going to try and replicate it because I'll make myself sound like a right <laughs> <one>. but, <laughs> Needless to say, it yeah. was shocking. Um, yeah. But these things, they I are bet. big. But I don't, yeah, that's the thing. I've, I've obviously, but they're unmistakable. No, and that's it. And looking at sort of pictures, obviously, for the purposes of, of this episode, you look at it and you think, well, up close, that is undeniably a bird, you know. And, and you know, some of the encounters haven't been, you know, that kind of far away in terms of the distance between, you know, the the, the sort of the, you know the victim if you like and and you know the reported mothman so if you're looking up in the uh, the sky you know would you look at that and think oh no actually no that is, is a bird and, and personally looking at those images I, I think you would I think you know you, you any anyone could you know you wouldn't have to be a marine biologist or a, a bird watcher to to kind of identify that as the creature that that it is I mean the only thing that I think that might kind of lend it, you know, some support to the the whole debunking is also the noise that that you referenced. In a lot of the encounters, people do report hearing a screech or a, a noise which is not like nothing they've heard. So, and obviously, then you referencing that, yeah, if if, if you heard that shriek or or that oh, noise, it wasn't it, it wasn't like necessarily like a shriek, but I suppose you could probably liken it to okay. Um, like a pterodactyl from like uh, Jurassic, right? Okay, Jurassic yeah, Park Three. Do you remember what they? Yeah, yeah. The big bird They're in the yeah, that's it. And it's making that noise. Is it, that's pretty much the the okay, the fair enough. Probably um, compare it to really okay. Um, I mean, the idea that it's a bird, it just to me, it, it, it doesn't add up because no, it's a bit wishy washy. I think for me, in terms of alternate theories that they could have come up with it's probably it's the most obvious but i think it's also the weakest because none of the other characteristics add up if that's what you're gonna believe you know it also comes down to actual physics and biology of other creature of that sort of size if it's if it stood at like seven feet tall mm. um like so some people have even said that that it could possibly be a very large owl um and if yeah it, I mean, it says that it's a seven, about seven or eight feet tall, and it right. had mm. what, ten feet. Wingspan. Well, the crane, well, the the, the sandhill crane or the heron have reportedly have up to a seven foot wingspan, mm, but, but the the creature, the though. yeah, up up to ten feet, yeah. Well, if if that's if that's the case, then if it was say a big owl and it stood that tall, mm. you're looking at an eight or nine foot owl. <laughs> well, it's going to have a forty eight foot wingspan. Yeah, and I, I mean I've seen some big owls, might, but nothing quite like that. <laughs> no, no. I'll put it this way, right? If it was, um, if it was, if that was the case, that's fourteen and a half meters. That's longer than a London bus. As yeah, a span. Mm. that's like nothing exists like that anymore. The only thing that did ever exist was Nargentavis. That's the only right. thing that ever existed that was that sort of size. Yeah, I don't think it even got to that sort of that's that big really. So, 
No, it's definitely up there, isn't it? Well, there was also legends in the area of a Washington Eagle. Um, right, which was something okay. I'd never heard of before. No. And a lot of, um, oh, I can't remember what they're, what they're called, the people that study aliens, mm. they, a lot of them don't even believe that this Washington Eagle exists. There's some very oh, wow. um, right. brief encounters with it in the, up the 1800s. Right. Um, but it was it was said to be um, 16 foot win, wingspan. Oh, okay. So a, a giant. Eagle. So an absolute yeah. huge. Yeah. I mean that. I mean the only things that I've read, which again we can come on to later on more specifically, is is accounts of basically man made suits. Where where people have tried to replicate found quite a few of those. birds, in, you know, in try in terms of wanting to sort of you know be the first human to fly and that kind of thing, so they've replicated, uh, you know, a, a suit that would be needed or required, mm. you know, to make a you know an average you know sort of human be able to to fly. And a lot of the accounts of people seeing that do pitch it up there with you know a wingspan of of that nature. Now, whether it would date that far back. That's the thing I'm probably not too sure about, but th that's another theory. I did find one um, over Coney Island in 1877, and well, there's a few yeah. sightings apparently, uh, 77 yeah. to 1880. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, Coney Island Beach, wasn't it? Where the... That's right. Yeah, and he said it was mm. doing like a swimming-like motion, mm. um, and it was about a thousand feet above uh, above the ground with bat wings. But yes, that's um, I mean, obviously. I've there are certain characteristics of Mothman. Yes, that's um, right. That yeah. A lot of these things don't necessarily match up with. One right. of them being the flapping of wings. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, They're more of like a glider, aren't they? As opposed to like the typical flapping motion that you expect from, you know, sort of from birds. It it tends to be more of a, almost like the wings are used as a glider. So it's very stationary in its movements, but it's propelled forward by by something. <laughs> Maybe Mothman have a jetpack. Absolutely. Well, I mean that—that's actually that does tie into a lot of <laughs> accounts that I've actually read. Um, again, in reaching is the uh, the engine. It's firing, the engine yeah. firing. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Um, I mean, you mentioned um, you, you mentioned bat wings. That actually, does um, segue quite nicely into the actual origins of where Mothman came from. Uh, in terms of the the name of of this uh, elusive creature, um, and it was actually uh, coined um, because at the time Batman was very popular. You know, the sort of the Adam West show in you know the sixties and seventies was uh, yeah, was uh, later became Mayor, obviously, as, as everyone knows. Um, was uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go? Was um, yeah, it was very popular at the time and. The name Mothman was taken from a popular villain uh, called Killer Moth, um, and so that's where it, it sort of lends its, uh, you know, lends its name. Um, so yes, yeah, so, I mean that's um, that's kind of the the origins, which we'll kind of dive into um, a little bit more sort of later, as well as um, talking about mm -hmm. some more of the similarities between the book and the film, and and how it was um, sort of dramatized, but. That you know, this this kind of leads into those characteristics that you know that you mentioned, Scott. Now I know we both um, obviously read up on this, and mm -hmm. I think for the most part we we agree that the, the, the there's at least nine very familiar characteristics that you can kind of pick out from almost every encounter that you're you know likely to read. Certainly the ones that are the most compelling and you know and seem to carry the most weight. Anyway. Um, like I say, there are nine that I've counted. Um, obviously, if there's anyone listening who has maybe found another one that we've missed, um, you know, do let us know. We'd love to. We'd love to hear it. But um, yeah, for the for the most part, I've seen that there's there's nine. So I'll, I'll go through those now. Um, as we've mentioned, it's uh, believed to be a, a large man-sized creature. Um, obviously, half half man, half bird. Um, it has a ten ten foot wingspan. Uh, Glowing red eyes, which I know we've mentioned in all, pretty much all of the podcasts thus far. Um, so that's a regular, regular occurrence. Um, apparently, being close to it uh, can bring on bouts of fear and confusion, which in some accounts 
or almost all the accounts that I've certainly read, that is certainly a symptom that the, you know, the I suppose victim, if you want to call them, um, certainly does recount. Um, it's also been reported to bring on um, insanity and death. Um, the death part plays quite a prominent part in some of the other um, accounts that we'll go through uh, as being a potential harbinger of death. Um, but as I say, we'll we'll go into that a little later on. Um, but but that link with death, I think, might also be why they use the death's head hawk moth in a lot of the imagery. Um, you know, more so John Kill's book and also the um, promotional items for the uh, for the movie. Um, so definitely adds some sort of credence there, really. Um, death's head moth is uh, it's a bit of a creepy one as well, anyway. Yeah, yeah, oh, um, bloody hell, yeah. That's used in Silence of the Lambs. Yes, no, absolutely, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, no, it is. Um, yeah, it's a great film. Um, the, one, one of the more funny uh, characteristics that I was able to find is, is that it's the, the Mothman himself is reported to be clumsy on foot um, yeah. and and could easily be outrun. Uh, and I know that that ties into a few uh, accounts, um, namely, I think, one in Mexico that, that jumps to mind. Where it was actually chased through some undergrowth, um, and the, the the person that obviously chased it recounted that it was it was quite quite clumsy. You know, would sort of stumble forward, not being able to sort of regain its balance and that kind of thing. But it pops up in you know sort of a few others as well uh, that will that will go over. Um, this one's probably the, probably the most compelling is is how is how it flies directly up into the sky. Um, you know, at quite a quite a speed. Um, 100, uh, 100 miles an hour is what people have, 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 have sort of mentioned. Um, but it, it, it's, wings, it, just, it doesn't, it just, wings and yeah, it goes up like a Harrier jump jet. Pretty much, yeah, like a jump jet or a helicopter. It just it opens its wings and bang, flies, you know, or, or glides, whatever, you know, straight up into the, uh, the sky at quite a speed, um, really. That's, I mean, where anyone could measure. 100 miles an hour i'm not entirely sure but it's certainly at speed um from from what most people um you know have said you know almost like you know it's on the ground one minute and then literally the flick of a switch it's it's hundreds of feet in the air um it's not natural exactly yeah um and obviously being around the same time as um you know as injured cold and much like we sort of discussed or certainly touched on in the bigfoot episode is that uh, Mothman sightings have also been linked or, or reported to have happened around the same time as other UFO sightings. So if some reports to have seen uh, the Mothman, then, you know, rest assured that within a certain mile radius or certainly within, uh, you know, a, a close proximity, people have other accounts of, you know, your standard, um, you know, sort of UFO, you know, the sort of flying saucer or the disc. Sort of shape. Um, one particular characteristic with with UFOs in that it chases cars. Yes, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. UFOs have been known yeah. in various accounts to chase the people down in their cars, like Woody Derenberger. Yeah, well, um, like the two couples um, that started off this whole yeah. man thing, the Scarberries and uh, and Malay. Malay. Yeah. So yeah, that's definitely that's a good one. Yeah. Um, and also right. overwhelming fear. Um, it, it, some people, yes. even when you listen to their accounts, um, they go as far as to say, I've never felt fear like it before or since. Yeah. Which, which could be, you know, there is a science with regards to um, ultrasonic sound. Um, yes. That, that can actually have an effect on the body. Can have an oh, definitely, yeah. Emotions as well. So it can like, install unbelievable, overwhelming fear in you for effectively no reason yes you know what yeah. would seem to be no reason you could just be sitting there and all of a sudden uh, you could be hit by this ultrasonic sound yeah and it would just have this effect on you and brings on fear and anxiety anxiety sorry and john keel does actually say that in the book that he's driving past uh one of the the igloos is what they call it where they mm. would store the the munitions oh he's yeah driving down uh down the, the long stretch of road and as he got to this one part he would feel this overwhelming fear of oh my god i've got to go back i've got to go back and then he'd drive on and he'd be fine yeah and he tested it a couple of times mm. and he found that the, at this very particular location is where he felt this overwhelming fear and dread 
and anxiety. That's interesting. Well. Yeah. That's interesting, actually. Yeah. Mm. Um, that's a good point. Actually. Yeah, because because again, it, it ties in to a few of the stories, and obviously one of the main characteristics that I've certainly um, found is that yeah, it brings on that that fear and and confusion. So yeah, as you say, there's that whole kind of why am I feeling this like this? Why is it at this point that I start to feel scared or or anxious? But then, as you say, a certain amount of time will pass and it goes. Or if you drive from that that, that area back to you know home or wherever it was you were heading, it seemingly disappears as quick as it came on. And luckily enough, for, for people like you and I, John Keel had the sense of mind to test it, to go back. Yes, back actually, back yeah. Forth, back and forth sort and actually find that it was a localised something. Yeah, and to sort of debunk it himself almost, which he does a lot in his book, actually. He does. In he fairness to him, very yeah. much an investigator, and he's done yeah. he's done a hell of a lot of work over the years, mm. and he's, a lot of his work is very compelling, um, just because yeah, of the amount definitely. of effort that's gone into it, but also the way in which he formulates his his thoughts and ideas is in itself, it becomes very agreeable, very agreeable yes. right, with regards to what he believes West Virginia is. Yeah. Um, West Virginia Definitely. believes that West Virginia is one of these window areas where high strangeness yeah. tends to happen um, on a regular yeah, basis. Definitely. Where a window area is where something can move between one dimension and another or one mm. person and another, whatever it, it yeah. seems to be. Because let's be honest, Absolutely, we yeah. no. No, we no, don't. No. Sure. I'm not sure if it's ever, you know, ever something that will be... Um, you know, that will necessarily be uh, be proven, but no, it certainly adds to the theory. And, and yeah, like you say, he's a genuine investigator. He's not trying to be preachy in any way or convince you that the Mothman definitely exists because he, he meets certain characters who he just basically laughs at or snarls at and he just says, yeah, these were these were kooks or these were, these were crazies. Yeah. Um, but then there are other accounts that, you know, you can tell visi- you know, visibly shook him or, or certainly st- stayed with him you know, since, you know, he interviewed that person or they recounted their story. So he's definitely, I mean, not necessarily on the fence because obviously you do find out kind of what he, what he believes, but he's certainly trying to play, you know, a level filled with it, you know, and it, it, being impartial, that's right. He, he's trying, he's not trying to convince you really one way or another, but he does it in a way that kind of allows you to make up your own mind, um, you know, which I think is... Um, which I think is good, and certainly for the purposes of what we're trying to also achieve, it uh, does kind of lend a hand, you know, to, to sort of that as well. So, um, but again, if you know, if anyone's interested, I'd definitely recommend reading the reading the book, um, if you know, for nothing else, because it's got everything. It's not just Mothman; it's you know, a few other that sort of cryptids and time, yeah, incredible. everything, everything, which is um, you know, which is nuts. Which, which I think is is kind of a good. Um, well, a really good segue actually into the next um into the next section actually um which uh which going on to you know the opening of of a, these sort of a window as you uh, as you put it um we'll go over some some other accounts um you know other possible sightings uh, encounters um and certainly these are going to be the most compelling out of the ones that that there's sort of the hundreds that we've read through um but you know they they add a little something you know, to the the folklore, or they add a bit of you know legend to it. Um, but but if nothing else, there's actually witnesses. You know, we've got names, we've got dates. You know, actual circumstances that that lend itself to, if you're on the side of wanting to believe this, you know, then these are the encounters that you're gonna, you know, that you're gonna wanna, you know, read. Um, I suppose the it, it seems fitting to you know jump into the the first one, which is 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 possibly um, the first encounter um, or sighting, should I say, sorry, of uh, the Mothman, although it wasn't highly publicised really um, until until later on. Um, they didn't even report it until they didn't. long after because it didn't even cross their minds. It was just, nah. well, I'll let you... I'm... Well, I mean, it will become clear why they probably didn't, you know, mention it because with their occupation, their probably quite inclined to see a lot of weird stuff going on anyway so i think you can probably forgive them for not reporting it straight away um but this one occurred do see a lot of weird stuff well exactly yeah (laughs) um 
uh, yeah, so this this one occurred um, two or three days uh, before the Scarbris and um, Marley's, uh, you know, cited him uh, on November twelfth, nineteen sixty six, in Clenandine, West Virginia. Um, this uh, this sighting involves uh, five people who were digging at a graveyard. Um, hope, hopefully, they were grave diggers and not body snatchers, but uh, they were there nonetheless. <laughs> and uh, yeah, exactly. Um, they reported uh, seeing a large man-like creature swooping down over their heads and essentially disappearing behind a tree line just ahead of them before um, essentially landing um, and, and standing behind one of the, the said trees sort of in the, in the distance. Um, they all reported to, you know, have seen it, almost feeling it, you know, sort of whoosh, you know, f- you know sort of fly overhead. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and then, yeah, sort of disappear behind um you know behind the trees and you know as you, as you rightly say it wasn't until a couple of days later um that they actually reported it because you know as we said you know working in that type of environment having that sort of occupation you know you're gonna be possibly accused of oh you know your mind's just you know playing tricks on you you know if you're surrounded by you know death and dead bodies and whatever else are you just gonna is it just your mind you know playing tricks on you which is quite a popular theory amongst certain people is that is that this whole mothman thing is a is the workings of a over active imagination uh, basically some, there are some people that have even said that it's down to uh, mass hysteria um which yeah, yeah that's something that we're going to go into a little bit yeah later. yeah we will and, and like this theory, yeah exactly and this could lend itself to to this sighting because you know one of the five could have seen it mm-hmm. told the other four and then because they're in that environment, you're in that moment, they've all been caught up in it, and they're all, oh, yeah, no, I did see it, or, you know, it's over there, or, oh, you know, I felt it, or I heard it, or, you know, and so they all they all get sucked into it. You're, you're saying that, and I'll, I will, again, I've got a little bit of, got a little bit of science for you. Um, <laughs> science, yeah. son. A little science. <laughs> um, a little bit of science and psychology on that specific mm. thing. So that ties into yeah. what I want to talk about later on, really. Yeah, well, that's why I thought I'd mention because yeah, you know, as you mentioned, like the mass hysteria, I think it kind of flows into this. Well, not not that we're trying to debunk it because there isn't any evidence to say that it mm-hmm. that it did happen or that it didn't happen. This is just you know, notably the first. Happened. Yeah, exactly. It definitely happened. It all definitely happened. And that's the end of episode well. three. Thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, but this is the the first kind of notable account that happened, certainly in West Virginia. Obviously, we'll go into earlier ones from around the world. But certainly from where it all kind of kicked off, yeah. you know, that was yeah. the that was the first one. Um, as brief as it was. As brief as it was, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this this next one, which I think we'll both kind of chime in with because it certainly links back to, um, you know, the, the first one that we mentioned with uh, the um, Scarberries and the Malays. Um, but this one um, occurred around the same time in fact it might have might even have been a, a number of hours um after the scarberry and, and marley uh sighting um so around the 15th of november um but in salem west virginia uh and this involved a uh, mr merle partridge um who reported w- was sitting watching his uh his tv um when a high-pitched noise began sort of coming through his tv set um i don't know if that was accompanied by white noise or whether the picture just stopped and then the the high-pitched noise came through the telly the, the, you said it was playing up like the, the, up there. yeah like signal kept dropping in and out or the west virginian uh dialect would be something a little bit different than, than it playing yeah up, but, um... <laughs> yeah a little bit more colorful than that but yeah, certainly along those lines um yeah, basically it was, it was net acting a fool or, or... yeah Something like that. Um, I might do that again, sorry. Yes, <laughs> yes sir. Uh, his, uh, he, he's, he claims that his dog then started barking at, uh, at the, one of the doors in, in the house that, that, that leads out onto uh, a porch uh, of, of sorts. He, he gets up and goes outside to basically uh, investigate. Um, as soon as he opens the door, um, Mel Partridge um, reports that uh, he spotted a tall creature again with glowing red eyes um standing um not on the porch but a few feet from from the bottom um just standing kind of 
looking at him, you know, looking towards sort of the house. Um, his dog immediately chases after it. And this is where it, it, it the, the whole, shepherd, wasn't it? yeah. Yeah. So it was a yeah, big old dog built for, built for running. Um, and this is where one of the, you know, sort of reports of it being clumsy on foot because the, the dog for, from what he reports almost caught up with it until they both entered into the surrounding woodland. Um, and, you know, at that point, you know, he, he lost sight of both of them. He, he, I think he, he runs in um, to... Runs into grab his rifle. He runs in to grab, grab his rifle while shouting for the dog to, to come back to him. Um, when, he, when he enters back into the house to grab his rifle, um, he comments that there was... He, he then sees a herringbone pattern flashing on the TV as the, as the, the noise uh, starts to get sort of quieter almost suggesting that the further away you know the mothman was running from the house the sound was almost following it in terms of it the disturbance in the tv was reducing almost the further he got away from the the mothman sorry got away from uh from the 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 property that's that's kind of um implying that there was some sort of electromagnetic interference yeah exactly yeah um, the moth mat, the, the some sort of yeah magnetic field of some dis, dis, description yeah um and yeah i mean i'm unfortunately that's i mean this is where it kind of ties in to the the first sighting but he he, he runs out of the, the the property through the the farm towards the the woods um and also in search of the creature and his his dog never to actually find either again Sadly, by that point, by the time he'd actually got outside, the the, the barking had stopped. Yes, he said oh, he, he did. He couldn't hear the dog barking. Um, he never saw the dog again. No, no, he didn't. All, all that was found was um, paw prints near his one of his barns to the the rear of the the farmland, almost as though he had sort of ran to the barn mm. and then stopped. You know, there were no tracks leading anywhere else. Um, drag marks no yeah there. no drag marks no you know sort of blood fur you know nothing they just you know run towards um the barn and then you know and then and then that's it um just lifted straight up into the air yeah no exa- exactly exactly right. i was just gonna say almost as though it was picked up and, and carried um and it, unfortunately what the the well a dog uh certainly believed that it was um no partridge's uh dog uh, but the body of a, a dead dog was found on the side of the road uh, down the same interstate that the Scarberries and Marleys were, were driving down. If you read into their account, you know, we gave they a, a note of it, don't they? They made barely... a note that as they were speeding back to town, they saw yeah. a dead dog or a large dead dog on the side of the road. On the side of the road, yeah. Um, but when they came back out accompanied by the police, mm. it was no longer there. It was no longer there. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think, I mean, I can't remember, I'm probably going to get, I mean, my geography is bad at the best of times, so I'm probably going to get caught out by, by people, but I'm sure from my uh, earlier research, Salem, West Virginia and um, uh, Point Pleasant aren't that far apart in the grand scheme of things. So it's not, it's not like it's unlikely for Partridge's dog to be in that area. Um, I think it's only a matter of is it sort of twenty miles, something like that. Twenty, yes, yeah, so it's something around that distance. But either way, when I read it at the time, it didn't seem like it was overly, um, yeah, it was it wasn't overly unrealistic to expect the dog to wind up there, especially if it felt that it was chasing after something. And if it was a, you know, if it was quite a long chase, or if the dog had picked up a scent, then yeah, you know, I think it's quite reasonable to think that that's where it you know sort of ended up so that's, that's how the two sightings um you know are, are linked um you know anyway although they are you know miles of, of, you know apart um so yes yeah, so that's that's that one which again is i think it's another compelling one because you've actually got a name you know you've got a sighting and there were other disturbances in the area you know not just that they saw something flying in the sky and it disappeared it's um, quite a big distance. Sorry, mate. I was just looking on. Uh, oh, is it? Maps. It's quite a fair, fair distance. And I believe it was like something silly, like less than two hours. Basically. I mean, if it's going to be a couple of hours, then you know, in a couple of hours, depending on a couple of hours flight the speed. I suppose you're looking at probably fifty, 
50 to 100 miles maybe so maybe it's further than what i remember so maybe that's not um maybe that's not relevant of uh, parkersburg in fact basically oh right okay oh that's interesting that obviously that, parkersburg that links us into uh east. yeah that links us into we'll see injured cold um okay we are that's the distances i'll see not relevant then on, on this one i thought it was a lot closer so ignore that that sort of concludes that one, which again I think is one of the more sort of compelling, certainly of those that, that occurred in, in West Virginia around that time. Um, but uh, the next one is 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 where we start to go international. Um, baby. Yeah, um, the one I've got here is the Freiburg, Germany uh, encounter, which I did have some uh, sort of brief info on, but I know you've done a bit of a deeper dive on it. Well, before we go into that, I kind of want to stay within um, stay within the United States. Um, oh, okay. And there was actually a, a sighting in Mount St. Helen before it blew in. Uh, well, the sighting oh, okay. was on the seventeenth of May, nineteen eighty. It's not a, it's not a massively okay. detailed one or anything like that. But it was spotted by a resident of uh, Zilla. Okay. I don't know how, how they pronounce it, but in Washington. Oh, okay. Right before Mount St. Helen erupted. Um, spewing millions and tons of hot ash and killing 57 people. Oh, wow. Right. Okay. In this case, though, the Mothman was seen to be transforming or transfiguring into a person, but remained with the big red eyes. Oh, okay. So again, it's, oh, that's it's, intriguing. Again, we've um, the, the, the Point Pleasant thing where mm. it became the, the, all the sightings culminated over the 13 months Actually, in fact, apparently 13 months to the day of the, the Scarberry and Malay sighting, yeah, um, that the Silver Bridge collapsed. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Six people. Yep, that's right. Yeah. 13. Mm. Again, 13. Uh, apparently 13. 13 mm. on the suspension bridge that failed. Wow. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so I knew it was a structural um, issue that they believe brought the. Uh, the bridge down but yeah no i didn't know i didn't know that bit that's interesting but there's weird numerology sort of so 13 yeah but yeah i will go back to international and go back to germany and um, it was on yeah. the 10th of september 1978 and mine right. in freiburg germany mm -hmm. a group of 21 miners arrived uh, in the morning to find a dark figure with wings on its back um, at the entrance to the mine mm. when they approached it it unfurled its wings and let out a now, these are very, very specific descriptions. Yeah. A sound like 50 people screaming. Right. Or a train in peril trying to break <laughs> at the sight of a twisted rail. I, I mean, that is very specific. That is, that is very specific, yeah. I mean, I've, I've kind of heard other accounts where they say that it, yeah, that it is just like a, a lorry um, breaking hard. And you have that, that screech of the, the metal. Um, you know, sort of the brakes connecting. It's that kind of shriek that um, that it's been oh, yeah. to. So yes, it's not a million miles away from other no, descriptions. But, I, like but description. I love how Herald descriptive. Yeah, at the sight because the, the trains have got sight. They have the sight of twisted rail. I just, I just really like that. I love that. Yeah, I love the imagination in that. Very German. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very efficient. <laughs> Opting to stay out of the mine. And work on other tasks the workers were soon disturbed by a large explosion from within the mine itself mm. um, the entity's presence had actually prevented them from entering the mine and thus saved their lives yeah it's a little bit different from uh, the other the other yeah. accounts that we've already detailed so the point pleasant and yeah you know, st helen where people had died but it's a, yeah because have been a harbinger of death whereas this one's actually saved them yeah yeah it seems like it's actually stopped them from going inside the mine um, yeah, however, no, absolutely. However, six out of the 21 workers, apparently saved by the monster, were still working. They, they continued to work within the mine six months later. Right. Two of those men, um, who had pledged to detail the indisputable facts uh, of the case for the rest of the world, perished suddenly, broke and destitute. So they, their lives had been completely ruined. Because wow. I, I would assume it's a similar sort of thing to con contactees in that they bring their story to the public and mm. they tell people about it and then they get hounded by yeah. thousands of different people from mm. all different walks of life. Um, yeah, exactly. Which is exactly what happened to Woody Derenberger, wasn't it? Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. 
um, and the others were plagued by psychiatric problems. Um, yeah. The Darkwing creature became known as the Freiburg Shrieker. Yes, absolutely. And, and that, what you said about the bouts of, um, you know, insanity and stuff, obviously leads into one of the, the nine characteristics that we covered um, earlier on, um, that it brings on, yeah, fear and in, insanity and, and eventually death. So although it may have, you know, saved those 21 miners initially, it did bring about their demise, you know, in, in one way or another, um, you know, in the months that months that followed. But um, the only the only other thing I read on that, um, which isn't any any difference to what you've said, but the reason that it wasn't because they were concentrating on other tasks that they that they left the area. It was more through out of sheer fear from what yeah. they'd seen and the sh- pure disbelief of what they'd seen that they actually left the site, not you know not returning for you know quite I think it was days, um, and then obviously it was that, but it was hours after they sighted it. That the mine collapsed. Yeah, no, that's that's kind of what yeah. took it for me. I didn't think it was like, yeah. oh, fuck that. I ain't going in there. I'm going to do got some jobs out here. I'm going to do I'm going to do the sweeping over there instead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I clean the roads? Yeah, you know, just do that. I'm going to go in the mine. That See, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, no from me. Yeah, it's not on my job sheet, Gov. I'm not not any, doing that. Any tradies out there? Yeah, I don't have a ticket for that. <laughs> there was another one that um we both found that was quite a large one um yes and it dates back even further than that it dates back it to 1926 mm-hmm. and it's the 19th of january and it was in china yeah it was the shante dam collapsing it was um, no. now the I, I did have to get onto google translator <laughs> i may be saying yeah <laughs> exact pronunciation of it and all I kept thinking about was the American fitness guy, Sean T. <laughs> Sean T. Damn. Damn. Sean T. Damn. <laughs> so, so I said I wouldn't do it. I you said did. I wouldn't do you did. Back. You've so let yourself said, down. I did. I've let you all down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to everyone out there. <laughs> um, anyway, anyway, get back to China. Um, <laughs> The event surrounding the appearance of a shadowy winged figure, later dubbed Man Dragon, began yes. in 1926. Almost overnight, sightings of this very large winged black figure mm. began to spread around the small farming communities located beneath the dam. Yes. The creature reportedly was seen hovering above the dam and frightened several people who witnessed it. Mm. So, during the height of the, the Man Dragon sightings, though, um, so the, it was it culminated in the dam um, suffering huge structural failure. Mm. Um, although most records and reports of this disaster were destroyed by the CCP, mm-hmm, okay, it, because it's yeah, pre, we guessed. It's yeah. pre-communist revolution in China, right? Okay, um, many of the survivors of the horrible disaster did confirm that the man dragon not only showed itself to. Uh, the victims, but also the people that were working on the dam, but managed to survive it as well. Right. Okay. Confirmed that uh, that hundreds of people mm. saw this thing floating about. Um, and, I mean, it was it's quite horrific, really. Fifteen thousand people died. That's a lot. But, I mean, but then, burns. I know you've obviously you're probably going to lead on to it. But when you consider the sheer amount of water that was released from that that dam. Yeah, 40 million gallons. It wiped out towns, didn't it? You can come across the pictures of the devastation, and it's Mm. just that. If It's like tsunami level, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. If if that is a a Mothman sighting, Mm. then that in itself has got to be its biggest. Yeah. (sighs) Death toll. Kill count. Yeah. Really? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's uh, it's just absolutely shocking. I mean, the the, the pictures itself are, are harrowing, um, and it, you know I'm not entirely surprised that the Communist Party of China are trying to trying to, to delete it, delete it from history. Yeah, exactly. They tried to delete everything else. Yeah, I mean, it's it's harrowing to think that something like that, you know, happened. As you say, when you do see the photographs that were taken of the devastation that followed it, yeah, you know, as you say, it is. 
you know, is horrible to see. And, you know, part of me would hope that, you know, the, the people, someone just hasn't used the, the tragedy of what happened there as a reason to kind of fabricate a story and, and sort of add some sort of uh, uh, kind of um, romance to, you know, a, a story that they just wanted to, you know, create, to add a bit of fantasy to it or, you know, to just kind of take away anything from the actual, you know, disaster it, itself. Because, I mean, it, it, obviously with regards to what the CCP have, have, have done with accounts like this, is where they've tried to delete the accounts and delete the history. Yeah. So it's going to be very difficult to actually get real evidence, like traceable evidence, or traceable mm. details, should I say, of who saw what and when it was. And also, it's like 100 years ago almost. Almost, quite yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> There's quite a few people in China that live a lot longer than... Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. Um, but yeah, it's... <sighs> that in itself was... The, the, the man dragon was seen mm. by hundreds of people mm. in that area and it culminated in the dam bursting. Similar, exactly, yeah. Similar, similar sort of thing with, um, with Point Pleasant. For 13 exactly. years, there was all, hundreds of sightings yeah. of this mothman and it culminated in... The Silver Bridge collapse, isn't it? Dying. Yeah. yeah, and and more. I think there were more that were injured. Wasn't there? Is that right? Or... Yeah, yeah, a lot more people because they managed to get some people out out of their cars or off the bridge. People was um, hypothermia. It was in yeah. December. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, December in North America, and in the you know middle of winter, you drop into mm. that, that freezing cold water. That's it. You're done. Yeah, and if you weren't crushed by a you know bridge debris or your your car, then you either drowned or essentially froze to death. Um, but yeah, no, you're right. It's it's you know oh. hundreds of sight. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> hundreds of um, you did you got dark quick. Got heavy. Got um, heavy there, guys. Sorry. Exactly. Well, it doesn't um, you know, it doesn't necessarily get any any better. I mean, these these next three are, you know, they're going to be well known, um, you know, to everyone. Um, so I don't know. We we were unsure as to you know whether we should input a, a trigger warning. Yeah. So that that leads into. Not the most recent, um, but certainly the I think the first out of the three, if, if memory serves. But this was the infamous um, Fukushima um, nuclear reactor in uh, in Japan, um, which was uh, I mean I'll, I'll give a, a sort of a fairly brief outline of, of essentially what happened, um, and basically on the eleventh of March two thousand eleven, an earthquake um, hit actually that region in that, that area of uh, Japan and upon detecting the movement the active reactors at the plant shut down automatically now as part of that shutdown and, and other issues with the electrical grid um, the station as you'd expect has got backup generators that, that kicked in um, but unfortunately shortly after the station was hit by a 46 foot high tsunami, um, which flooded the first four reactors. Um, 20 meters high. Yeah. That was the metric. Yeah, which is ridiculous. So you think the area has just been hit by uh, an earthquake, which re registered quite highly on the, the scale. I think it might have been a seven, if I remember rightly, on the, is it Richter scale? Um, and yeah, and so then shortly after, so once the generators had just started to kick in, a 46-foot-high tsunami then flooded the first four reactors. Now, because of the sheer volume of, of water um, that hit the low levels of the reactors, the, the diesel um, generators um, basically didn't kick in or didn't fire up enough because um, they were basically needed to send coolant around the reactor core to keep them from overheating obviously that unfortunately didn't happen um and that led to um three nuclear meltdowns three hydrogen explosions and the release of radioactive contamination um we, and that all occurred between the 12th and thir uh, 15th of march so it, it did take at least four to five days i think for the real kind of devastation to 
to kind of hit, but it was probably a good week long sort of event, really. Um, that, that happened. There's earthquake, there are aftershocks. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Like 7. Yeah, 7.1 magnitude. Yeah, um, earthquake, and then the strongest aftershock was 5.3. Jesus, that in that's an aftershock. Bloody hell, right? Okay. Yeah, so I mean, so that's the yeah. So for those that didn't know, I'm sure everyone is probably familiar with it by now. But for those that didn't, that was kind of in a in a in a nutshell, essentially, you know what what happened. Now, the obviously the links to Mothman come from an account um, that was reported to uh, a, a local blog site actually, um, and uh, it was a, a teacher from the UK. Uh, his name was David Heath, and he was visiting a fellow friend who's also a, a teacher who's out in Japan teaching English. Um, and they were in an area close to the uh, the power plant. Uh, they were searching in an area or a site around the, the power plant, looking for um, sort of weather vanes and other instruments that were used to kind of judge and predict the weather. And it was a project that um, David Heap's friend had got his students to participate in. And, and kind of set them around various areas around the around the site. Uh, it was whilst they were out looking for these instruments and, and sort of checking the data um, that they claimed to have heard a whooshing noise overhead, um, which is similar to that of the grave diggers back in, in West Virginia. Um, and that was followed by an ear splitting screech as, uh, as, oh. as, as, as he noted it. Um, they both looked up to follow the noise and basically claimed to have, have seen a, a big dark colored figure um, circling one of the reactors a little further ahead at the, at the power plant. Um, it circled it a couple of times before shooting straight up into the sky, going back to that characteristic of no kind of sort of flapping or gradual, you know, ascension. It was just a quick bang straight up into into the, the sky um you know they they thought nothing more sort of of it they were obviously reluctant because of their profession more so than anything they didn't want anything to jeopardize their careers um so although david heath has later come out to report this account he actually refers to his friend by another name who's presumably still in teaching to you know obviously help you know save his career basically yeah and protect his identity um but it was days later when he. Him, I would have shopped you right in. I know you would have. Yeah, you would have shot me right in, right under the bus. Him. Uh, he saw it. Yeah, uh, that pleb. He saw it. In <laughs> fact, he saw it first. <laughs> it, it was his fault. <laughs> I didn't see it first either. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You want to talk to him, bastard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was. It was days later in the UK um, when David Heath returned that he saw on a news report. Um, that, yeah, that, that basically the earthquake had then happened at the nuclear reactor plant. So they'd, they'd, they'd seen that the, just as a sort of a rough timeline, if no one's following, they they were around the plant looking for these sort of weather vanes. David Heath returns to the UK a couple of days later, then sees the report of the, the first earthquake hitting that area of Japan and obviously affecting Fukushima. Uh, around the 11th of, of March. So again, it's another sort of premonition of, you know, seeing the Mothman and then later, you know, a, 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 a quite significant disaster happens. And unfortunately, in, um, you know, in, in, on this occasion, it did lead to, um, you know, quite a high number of deaths. I mean, nowhere nowhere near the, the levels of the um, Shantae uh, Dam, but um, yeah, certainly up there. And again, you know... The tsunami certainly did kill... That, I mean that got that that really? got yeah it got a lot of um yeah got a lot of sort of people so again you would hope that there is you know even if you don't have to you know believe in the Mothman you would hope that they saw something which led them to to this you know account and that they've not just used it to fabricate a story and get some sort of notoriety on online I mean this was printed in. I think a local press at the time. It was it's online on a on a blog, um, hosted by a, another individual, um, and he even goes to the point of you know disguising his friend's name to help protect his reputation and career, presumably on the assumption that he's still you know a teacher. So you'd hope that 
if they didn't see the Mothman, that they at least saw something that led them to believe that it was that. So you, you know, you'd hope that it wasn't, you know, sort of fabricated. <clears throat> um, this leads on to, you know, sort of a, another one very much in the cut from the same cloth, um, which was, uh, as everyone will definitely know, um, the infamous uh, terrorist attacks um, on the World Trade Centers um, in uh, in New York on September the 11th, 2001. Um, I'm not going to go into obviously the, the history of that because that's a podcast in itself, and, and everyone uh, everyone knows what what happened uh, there. Um, but the interesting thing with this, and, and I think I have read probably more reports to debunk this sighting than what I've seen in evidence that supports it. Um, mostly because I can't find a specific account from an individual coming forward to say I was there on the morning this is where I was standing I looked up saw the figure etc etc it's just a lot of all I've read is a lot of our articles basically summarizing what happened um, which is basically that on the on the morning of the September 11th attacks um, the Mothman was reportedly seen circling the World Trade Center um, before disappearing behind the buildings to then never be, you know, seen again. Um, but then there's reports saying that later on um, in the in the day, um, the Mothman is seen flying parallel with one of the planes just before it strikes the uh, the Twin Towers. Or one of the towers, sorry, I don't know which one, which again makes me think that this is just someone trying to fabricate something, yeah, and it makes it a bit, well, th that it's nonsense. And, you know, we don't... It's storytelling, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've only come across this, you know, sort of recently, but it seems to be something that was created for the purposes of uh, Creepypasta, um, which is just uh, sort of on, basically just online storytelling for anyone that, that doesn't know. And I didn't until you know, sort of recently when, when looking into this and, you know, a few of the other uh, cryptids for, you know, for sort of research and stuff. So that, that is literally the only account really that I've read in various different forms on different articles and in different um, sort of blogs. I mean, it didn't even, I don't think it even made it to press. I don't think a national newspaper or anyone picked it up. So I think that kind of gives a certain clue as to the validity of, of this. Wow. You know, the Daily Star, isn't it? If if anyone does, it will be the the uh, the Daily Star, yeah, or yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, it's not much of a compelling account, but I just thought from the severity of the attack and what happened, and the fact that someone has supposedly seen the Mothman and attached it to this disaster, mm. you know, again, I thought it was maybe worth noting for those reasons. But yeah, I, I think for the most part, it is utter nonsense um and which is unfortunate because obviously it was a you know it was a terrible thing that happened and again thousands of people lost their you know lost their lives and for the for someone to go to the, the lengths of creating something to glorify that event you know for, for what a, a fairly piss poor article on you know if, if they came up with you know names and accounts and gave it a real backstory you know it'd still be shocking but at least you could give them some sort of nod for the creativity behind it but the fact that there isn't anything of that nature you know I, th I think it's a real a real shame really and it doesn't kind of add much credibility to you know the mothman as a legend or you know as a, as a folklore when it's being you know kind of attached to, to things like that but it, it happens like i said i thought it was interesting enough to certainly mention for those that maybe want to try and dive deep into it you know themselves to yeah, see like if they can find anything <laughs> but yeah but don't bother is, is essentially yeah. the uh, yes, essentially my my opinion on it. Um, yeah, the, the the next one, um, which is the last of the the sort of the more notable um, sightings, again a very well known incident that occurred on the twenty sixth of April, nineteen eighty six, um, in Chernobyl, northern Kiev, Ukraine. Um, and I'm sure everyone right away knows what we're going to be uh, talking about. Uh, so again, I'm not going to give a backstory because. If anyone watched no Chernobyl that. and Sky Atlantic, I think that does it. That tells you everything oh, you need to know. <laughs> which was an exception, exceptional TV show. Which, as a side note, if you haven't seen it, then go and watch it because it yeah. is superb. 
Um, but yeah, so basically, I, you know, in a nutshell, um, nuclear reactor um, at the Chernobyl power plant um, basically failed, causing a, another um, explosion. Um, but in the days leading up to the disaster, um, workers based in the control room of the power plant claimed to have seen a creature which is now known as the Blackbird of Chernobyl, um, basically flying around um, re the Reactor 4, which I think is the yeah. one that had the, the explosion. Um, it, and again, the descriptions follow the stereotypical ones that we've already kind of gone over, um, you know, half man, half half bird, glowing red eyes, um, you know, sort of black, you know, um, sort of skin, if you like, and, and fur and, and, and or hair, that type of thing. So, yeah, follows all the same, you know, kind of characteristics. Um, it's It was later reported that those who claim to have um, seen the Blackbird of Chernobyl um, then started to receive sinister and threatening phone calls. Uh, the, the contents of those phone calls haven't, to my knowledge, been disclosed, but oh, really? they were sinister and and threatening. Um, that which... also ties in with what was happening in Point Pleasant. And also Parkersburg, because if you remember, certain people claimed to have received did, yeah. uh, threatening phone calls, advising them against talking about injured cold and UFOs. You know, obviously it happened in Point, yeah, Point Pleasant, as you rightly say, um, with a, a certain group of men in in uh, black suits, a certain attire, <laughs> a certain attire <laughs> black suits. <laughs> may or may not be listening in right now. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, basically making these said phone calls. So that that's that kind of adds a little bit of credence to it because it does match, but it could be deliberate. Um, but which I'll come on to when I go into the sort of the debunking of, of, of this one. Um, spoiler alert it doesn't appear to be true either <laughs> um <laughs> so they uh just like that. so they uh, receive these sinister and threatening phone calls um whilst also being plagued by um nightmarish dreams or nightmares <laughs> i don't know why they yeah, put nightmarish, nightmarish dreams. dreams just nightmares <laughs> then <laughs> but, but it made me laugh so i wrote it down um now yeah like i say they they claim to have seen the big bird-like creature circling the nuclear reactor days before the um, explosion. Um, and again, there isn't, you know, the name of, you know, any of the workers in the control room. You know, there isn't any kind of time of day or any real kind of... There's no real notoriety to no, the no to the claim. It's, yeah, nothing, yeah, exactly right. Nothing traceable. It's all very sort of whimsical and all very kind of... Yeah, like just someone's just mentioned it to sort of try and create something from nothing. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, just not very good storytelling. Um, and it, but it's it's like I say, like the nine eleven one, it has seemingly been debunked. Um, and again, might also lend its origins to uh, creepy pasta. Um, yeah. And not so much with this, the the 911 account but certainly with this one at chernobyl the, the origins of this one uh which has which has come from a, a a journalist in the states whose name i haven't written down annoyingly um but she mm. claims that the chernobyl uh sighting was inspired by a, a misleading line from the mothman prophecies movie um i'm paraphrasing because i've not got the exact line from the film but it Basically, it's um, the character Alexander Leek, um, who Richard Gere's character goes to uh, to visit because he's obviously made, uh, reported accounts of other people's sightings, which is basically the John Kill portion of, of that of that story. Um, but he basically says to to Richard Gere's character that that Mothman is what the Ukrainians call the creature. Um, obviously, you know we know that that's not the case because the name was coined by an American because Batman was popular. So this is where this journalist has kind of got two and two and, you know, sort of put it together really. So what she believes, this other journalist, she believes that the, the whole uh, story of the Chernobyl sighting has literally been taken from that line in the film and fabricated, you know, from that because 
yeah. interesting. I think the film was released in 2002 and the Chernobyl sighting wasn't reported until sometime in 2005. But obviously the Chernobyl incident occurred back in 1986. So there's quite a significant time between Chernobyl actually happening and then reports of this supposed sighting at the power plant then coming to the, the forefront. So again, I think this is unfortunately a, a fabricated story um, that's that's found its way online. Uh, and because again, there's no, um, yeah, again, there's no names of the, you know, from where the sources come from, you know, there's no kind of real, uh, what you said earlier, like searchable, um, traceable, details. traceable details, sorry. So you can't work it back to say, oh yeah, well that person, definitely work there or you know this is their account and it's got some credibility because of blah 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 um you know but but then also if anything like that was to have happened you'd imagine much like how it happened the russians would probably cover it up anyway so even if it is true we, we'd never know about it <laughs> so yeah um, they certainly did their best to cover up didn't they just but um but yeah again i think much like the september 11th one this is a fabricated story which is which uh, is is cool to an extent because it it brings in kind of real life events into the folklore, but it doesn't really do us any favors because it is taking a horrendous tragedy and trying to glorify it with you know this character that we're seemingly trying to dive deep into and either prove or disprove, and so this definitely goes in the favor of you know disproving basically because it's just a clear it's i mean it's two clear representations of people just writing utter nonsense to try and push a folklore or give it more kind of notoriety i'm a little less of you know i, I feel a little less kind of strongly about the fukushima one um mm -hmm. because i think there is a little bit but well, there's actually a person there's actually a report a timeline and the, the, the article, the, the blog, sorry, really does go into depth of the guy's experience and his visit to Japan. I just kind of paraphrased to, to kind of, yeah. you know, sort of help it, help it out. But I think that kind of, you know, with that kind of debunking towards the end, I think that does kind of, I think, nicely flow into the kind of the mythology and, and our sort of debate, really, and, and, yeah. Our, the, the sort of the intentions but behind it i guess well that's that's exactly where i've decided to take uh my research as well I, i've decided to go down the the mythological route and see what sort of creatures or folklore that there could be a connection with regards to uh, mothman so i mean the idea of that winged beings are harbingers of death has yeah. it's always been a, a strong basis in folklore and mythology Absolutely, even religion, isn't yeah, it? I think yeah. even the almost every religion, I think, has got a demonic or evil spirit, who more often than not is a winged creature. Absolutely, it, mm. it does. It, it goes from anywhere between angels and demons as winged. Yeah, because even angels were harbingers of, of death. Yeah, as well. supposedly. Yeah, um, absolutely. But it also goes down to Mothman and banshees, and I yes. found that banshees yeah. seem to be the. The, the thing that closely resembled what we would call um, a mothman. I mean, it has yeah. they have similarities, and there are some differences. Um, I mean, the similarities yeah. are they seem to be harbingers of death. Banshees are always harbingers. Always have been, yeah. Um, banshees were sometimes winged, but not always. Um, right. They glide instead of fly. Oh, okay. Um, they're large, glowing red eyes. Again, yeah. Uh, again. Yeah, <laughs> um, often seen over or near water. But uh, okay. The yeah. main differences between them is that um, the, the the main appearance seems to differ per region, and I'll go into that in a little bit. Okay. Banshees are always female. So yes, they are. Yeah. Woman. Not a woman, exactly. Yeah, I mean, we're not we're meeting, not one to discriminate here at Cryptid Ramblers. No, no, yeah. equal opportunities, everyone. Equal opportunities. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, early tales of banshees um, are told that they didn't just foretell your death, but they would seek to help you prepare for it too. Um, it's often right, okay in the early Irish mythology is seen as a protector to the family line and thought to have been an ancestor. Um, okay. Now the mythology appeared in the 8th century um, and maintained a strong hold on Irish culture 
up until the English started coming in and taking control over Ireland. And ruining it, yeah. Yeah, ruining <laughs> what we do. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the 18th and 19th century. By which exactly. time, in the 19th century, um, the Irish were present among the early settlers in West Virginia. Okay. And they came in particularly right. large numbers in the turn of the 19th century. They they helped build the early transportation network beginning the the, uh, the national road which arrived in Wheeling in 1818 which isn't too far from um, Point Pleasant if I remember rightly but it's, it was in the Appalachia area the Appalachian Mountains area Okay. so do you know where they are in relation to sort of the other events in, in West Virginia the, those mountains are they like in a close proximity or it's pretty much that area Oh, is it right? Okay. The Appalachian Trail, um, which was, I don't know too much about it, but I've heard about it, is a trail that um, people would like to do almost like a, a pilgrimage. Um, okay, right. And uh, they, they, they take these routes through the mountains. Um, and West Virginia is a particularly mountainous area, from what I understand. Mm. And it's, it's a strong yeah, it part does. of their culture. Does look like it. It's a national park, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, apparently. Mm. Oh, I mean, the, the sort of thing that I wanted to see is: is it possible mm. that the Irish brought their myths and the legends mm. with them to West Virginia, and could it actually yeah. culminate with the native legends from that area? Yeah, well? is an amalgamation of the two or something? Yeah. Well, it seems like as well, that the Native Americans, the, the, the various tribes that settled around the area, never actually settled in the area of West Virginia. Mm. Well, that is yeah. now known as West Virginia. Yeah, um, definitely. They've got yeah. their own legends and, and such. I mean, they hunted and they travelled through that land, but they never settled. Um, and it seems like they were particularly uh, scared of ghosts of a tribe that was wiped out. Um not going to go into yes, too much no, I remember that actually. That, I think yeah. that could be something we'd go into in a later episode. Um, yes, absolutely, yeah. Because I think it's it's worthwhile. It's a very interesting story that's that's given there. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, because weren't the tribes to the 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 was it the north, the west, and the south of West Virginia that they seem to concentrate almost like a circle around West Virginia, but never travel to the center of that area. It's, it's the Shawnee and, and Cherokee and the the south and the southeast uh the monacan i hope i'm pronouncing that correct uh, yeah. is over to the east east um, that was it okay is to the north okay so north um, south and east okay yeah i knew it was something like that yeah but they basically deliberately set up a perimeter around that area almost not wanting to to, to go into it um, well, they would they would still go in there and hunt and, and travel through the area, but they just wouldn't settle. No, that's it. Yeah, and they wouldn't they wouldn't live on that mm. land because they feared the the ghosts of the the tribe that was wiped out by the Shawnee. Mm. Um, uh, they they believed that they were come to take vengeance. Um, yeah, but yeah, well, we will go into that on a on a later episode. Um, but yeah, I just thought, could it be? Could the possibility of the culmination mm. effects of the Irish myths and the legends of the haunted native land mm. could it actually create paranormal events in west virginia the, the amount that we've seen could that yeah be the opening of that window of that window yeah exactly i mean because i know john and i think this is what you're alluding to but correct me if i'm wrong but i know john kill in his book sort of says that if if you if you think about something strong enough and you believe in something strong enough do you almost do you almost create it yourself from your own conscious and that actually sort of has a name it's called a tulpa Gone. right okay a tulpa and a tulpa is a tulpa. concept in okay. mysticism um, yeah. and it's of a, a being or an object that is created through uh, spiritual or mental powers mm. so when you when you think about something strong enough and it can be a, a singular effort or it can be a group effort this is mm -hmm. Um, there are there are people. It was a, a tulpa itself. The word is an, adapted by twentieth century theosophists um, from the Tibetan word sprulpa, sprul, sprulpa even. Okay, I'm probably saying that completely wrong. No doubt. <laughs> it sounds something like that. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. You get the, the Tibetan translator. Out. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't gonna do an accent. I ain't doing that. No. Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Sprulpa, um yeah. means emanation or manifestation. Okay. And people do practice um practice uh, the idea of talpas to this day. Um and they often refer to a type of wheeled imaginary friend mm. that is considered to have sentience or relatively thought to be yeah. relatively autonomous. So it's almost like it's exactly, just yeah. birthed into existence. Well that's where some people think Exactly, yeah. I mean that's where some people I think are along that going along those lines, where some people actually believe that's where uh, ghosts come from. Yes. Is that they don't actually exist per se, but you you know sort of believe in your heart of hearts strong enough that you can see you know a, a sort of a loved one or or some from a t- particular time period and you believe it to such an extent you know that you physically create that manifestation so you can physically see it in front of you it's not just in your imagination it's physically there in front of you as a an apparition or as a ghostly figure or however you see it but because you think about it into existence you yeah you bring it you birth as you rightly say you birth it into existence because you believe it and feel it so strongly that yeah that you that other people can then exactly yeah so you know you can then uh, sorry other people can then you know tap into it which again again kind of nicely links in that earlier account that we went over about the the five grave diggers you know, where I was saying that maybe one of them actually saw it or believed that they saw something um, and that he believed it so strongly and to such an extent that he was somehow able to actually manifest that sighting mm. that was so believable that the other four guys with him mm. actually then was like, oh, yeah, no, actually, no, I do see it. Or, yeah, no, it is yeah. there. or And that they, they experienced it. it. They yeah. remembered it in that way. They, they, through his That's projection, it. they created their own memory as like a branch off off of his yeah manifestation. But this is where I'm going to get a little bit psychological because did they create <laughs> that memory, or did um, the initial bloke who who saw mm. the thing exactly yeah he create that memory within them? Mm. Now this was something I, I kind of stumbled across actually in in my research, and it's the it's the power of suggestion and how easy it is to Im- implant a false memory or a screen mm. memory in some cases. So yeah. it's an actual study that was, that was done. I, I can't remember, I, did, I don't know why I didn't write down the date, but it was a, a study that was done by um, Elizabeth Loftus. Okay. It was at the University of California in Anaheim, mm. um, which is where Disneyland is located, and that's important. What she looked to okay. do was she looked to explore the claims that false memories can be created and ask the question that how easy they, that you could implant those memories. Yeah. So she would say to the participants, right, okay, we're going to give you $100 for an, hour's, an hour of your time this week. And then in a year's time, we're going to give you another $100 for another hour of your time. Um, and we want to see how your values have changed. Okay. I believe she was trying to see how their moral compass might have changed in that year. Right, after, gotcha. You know, your life experience and such. Yeah, of course. Um, but as with most psychological experiments, she actually lied to them um, because she didn't want to I... know how their morals and their values had changed at all. Yeah. Um, so she would, she, she created a ruse and she'd say, like, okay, welcome, come on in. Um, we'll take a look at your values and your morals as such. Ah, the examination room's busy right now. And whilst they're waiting for the examination room to become free, she would engage them in small talk. And she asked them if they'd been to Disneyland. But knowing full well that all of the participants had been because they had filled out a survey prior to right. signing up to this experiment. Um, so she would ask them, do you have any you know, a memory of anything from Disneyland? Asking an open question. Mm. Yes, no, maybe. Said they'd answer. Um, then she'd ask in quick su- succession, "Do you remember Daffy Duck giving you a hug? Did Daffy Duck give you a hug?" And then, not waiting for an answer, the examination room door would open. She'd go, "All oh, right, okay, go on, go through. You go to the examination room, and she would just let them do that. She did that one after another um, until they'd all gone. 
A year later, she'd have them back as you go through the same pretend delay, engage in small talk and ask about Disneyland. So the same thing, yeah. exactly. She'd ask the same open-ended question. Okay. Do you have any memories from Disneyland? Mm. And a quarter of them instantly remembered getting a hug from Daffy Duck. No which is way. Impossible because Daffy Duck isn't in Disney. It's Donald right. Duck that's in Disney. And so she had successfully implanted a false yeah. memory in 25% of people. I didn't even think just of that, by yeah. asking these two small questions. See, that's so mad. It shows just how easy it is to implant an idea or memory exactly. into, into a community as well. Exactly, yeah. I mean, and that's exactly, I mean, using the, the, the grave diggers from earlier as an example, you know, one of them could have turned to the group either during or, or after the supposed event and, and said, you know, along that same line of questioning, did you see that winged figure in the sky? Or, or what was that in the sky? Did you see it? And, you know, and if you ask the same, go, go down the same line of questioning and use descriptions of, you know, did you see that man, uh, that winged man or that winged creature or whatever, you know, and then speak to the group the next day and, and say, oh, do you remember when we were at the graveyard and we saw that thing flying in the sky? And then instantly they're all like, oh, yeah, no, I, yeah, we did see it. Yeah, I, I seem to remember seeing something or whatever because they think they're clawing on a memory that they've had when in actual fact one of them could have planted it either deliberately or or, or unknowingly so yeah i mean that's yeah and obviously and then the town of I mean, point pleasant that doesn't really uh, take into account is uh, those that have said that are definitely um seen by more than one person at exactly the same time so it doesn't for instance that doesn't take into account the scarbury and malay sighting no no, because they all yeah, have they the exact same. Right then and there. So yeah, there's no way of planting anything. There could be a psychological aspect to it all. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely, yeah. It definitely adds, I yeah, I thought that would be adds some weight to it because I st- kind of stumbled across that. You know, it's definitely worth mentioning because I remember when we, we we had a discussion before episode two, and I had said to you about when I first um, you know read about or or list, uh, heard about um, injured cold that mm. it it freaked me out. Um, and that I didn't know whether it was because it was just the story that freaked me out and it was the creepiness of the character or, you know, not that I'm saying I had an encounter or an experience, but was it something along those lines? And so I stopped myself dead there and then from kind of thinking about that side of things anymore deliberately because I didn't want to then start fabricating an encounter or a sighting or an experience that I thought I had had. Now, I know that that's just me or my own. Easy to do it. Because it would be easy to, to do. And because obviously we're diving into these cryptids and we, we'd already started the, the the process of doing the podcast, I didn't want to that to then influence my thoughts about injured cold or that subject or, or any future subjects. So, so yes, yeah, so, but that was me consciously doing it. But that was before I knew that that was even a thing. And uh, also the first I've heard of it is when obviously when you just brought it up you know, in your in your research, I definitely think that adds some weight to some of the some of the accounts, maybe not to all of them, but certainly to to some of them. And it's that want of, you know, you want to be a part of it, so you want to have had your own experience, your own sighting. And do you think about it? People about like that. Exactly, FOMO, isn't it? Essentially, for for the most part, and it, and if they think about it and believe in it, you know, strongly enough and intently enough, do you then? subconsciously create it so it then becomes part of your conscious do you know what I mean and so that that's definitely round, an, round, so it goes right. a full circle yeah it keeps going round and round yeah the idea that 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 implant that implanted memory could then eventually give give rise to manifest into an actual yeah it actually does birth itself into existence. yeah no, I like that yeah I mean you could go round and round and round with that you could end up in a padded room after a Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, after a whole night of thinking. Well, you could me. you could research into your your whole entire life about every memory that you think you've got, and unless you've got other people there to corroborate your memory or your story or whatever, you could yeah, as you say, quite easily go round and round in a circle, sort of thinking. Yeah. That's the nature of. of did that happen that or you? Yeah, your memory is very unreliable. That's the thing. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Say for instance, like if you like your seventh birthday or something like that you remember yeah. it being a really sunny day 
and yeah. for you and I, we have birthdays in the winter, so that yeah. wouldn't necessarily be no. the case. But if someone had said, like, you remember it being rainy, like, all day long, and then someone could, no, actually, on your birthday, it's actually quite sunny, it was quite mild out. Then, mm. that little seed of doubt yeah, and you'd be like, in your oh, own memory, yeah. then makes you go, oh, right, well, I guess it must have been yeah. sunny. And then when you tell the story again to someone else, you say, oh, it was quite a mild day on my birthday, and yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that's a that's a no, that's a good uh, little find there, man, because that definitely adds a different sort of theory to you know a lot of the a lot of the events. Certainly not all of them, but mm. but to certainly a, a lot of them as a potential, yeah, sort of cause. Was, going going back to um, our previous episode when I said about I chose the uh, Woody Derenberger interview. <laughs> yes to actually get the details from is because that was the freshest details. Yeah, short of actually being there with him, that was the, the freshest account of, of what happened because it was the, right after the day. On memory. Yes. You know, and so th- that in itself, I, I hadn't owned that before a couple of days ago, mm. that, well, that makes perfect sense because yeah. memory is unreliable. Absolutely, it's yeah. That we do go, we do try and get the very first accounts mm. that we possibly can, in order to get the the best details. And that is probably a better account than his book, because you can right. because you can hear him retracing the the, the encounter and, and and what happened. And as you say, because it was only a day afterwards, it's the freshest account, and it's more likely to be true in terms of the um, circumstances, because a lot of details do start to change a little bit when you listen to to you know to his book and so again that could tie into you know to your theory about the the whole psychological side and and manifesting a memory that maybe wasn't there you know beforehand you know once other people got involved or you know once yeah. other people give their account and you could be like and you, and if you want your you know if you want your account to match that of someone else you could then doubt your experience and be like oh, no, actually maybe it was that size or maybe it did have red eyes or maybe i've just forgotten or you know then you start to yeah fabricate your own your own memories from that so no, that's a good point man i like that yeah it certainly doesn't cover all of it but it certainly no, add, no, adds adds no, a theory to aspects to it that's for sure yeah so the, the so, majority of i think we've um i think we've come to the point that where maybe we need to get off the fence <laughs> what do we yeah do? um mothman oh, um what do i think i it's, it's it's probably the the hardest out of the three so far for me i think to to get off the fence about although i'm gonna try and do it the best i can um i i think it definitely is supported by you know this this window or the these portals that were seemingly opened in West Virginia in the 1960s, and it's just another you know you know creature or or you know manifestation of of sightings or, or of creatures that were actually seen. You know, and much like the 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 sort of the theory that I gave on my belief around you know Bigfoot, I think a lot of these maybe not so much injury cold, but certainly with Mothman and, and Bigfoot, I think they are manifestations of what either they want to be projected as or what we can easily identify them as. So, you know, they might actually look entirely different, you know, from where they're actually from, whether it be another dimension, another planet or whatever. They actually look very different, but they put on, a, 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 I don't know, a, I don't want to say costume, but I can't think of the word. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they put on a a uh, visual, a, a, yeah, a disguise or a, a, or a visual based on what they think we, as our species of humans, can can in, can interpret. Exactly, yeah, like a facade. Like, and, and it's how we can it's how we can identify it. So we could look, you know, if we looked at that creature, whether it be you know Mothman or Bigfoot or whatever, in its actual form then we probably don't have the mind or the comprehension to process what we're looking at. Whereas I think it, I think somewhere, whether it's lighting, whether it's, 
you know its essence or its being or whatever but it, it puts on a disguise so it's more naturally recognizable by us as a species so i think it i think it exists i think people you know truly have seen you know have seen something um mostly because the accounts from a lot of different people all center around the same characteristics and the same type of event there isn't really any deviation from the story also we, we covered some that are just pure fabrication but they still drew on a lot of the same characteristics but you're able to identify why they're nonsense but from a lot of the ones that are the most compelling it's either a different part of the world different part of west virginia but it all centers around the same thing without much deviation from the very first one now you could just say yeah okay they've, they've listened to the first you know account or read the first article about it and they've just had that in the back of their minds so then when something's happened to them that's the first thing that their memory clawed back from the depths of their imagination or, or memory and and that you know for the most part could quite easily be you know a, a, an easy explanation but I think like with most things that we're seemingly uncovering at the moment, there's a lot more, there's a lot more to it. Oh, so much more to it. Not so much more to it. And what, what I do want to bring up actually is, um, there's a listener's theory. Yeah. I've got a listener's theory. Uh, oh, wow. Oh, we've actually had one in, have we? We've actually got one in. Oh, superb. From, uh, okay. Justin. Oh, Justin. Yeah. yeah. Actually put forward. Um, obviously, yeah, you know, Justin. I do. I have met, yeah. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Um, you haven't yet shot yeah. him. Not yet, no. <laughs> I missed him every <laughs> time. <laughs> every time. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so Justin actually, um, he, he, he built me up a couple of days ago um, to talk about the podcast. Um, yeah. Give his feedback and such. Um, and he made Excellent. a very, very good point. Okay. There's a three-letter agency that has a HQ in Langley Falls, West Virginia. There the is the CIA, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, in the 1960s, yeah, there definitely was a program known as MK Ultra, in yep. which they experimented on American people with LSD. They did, yep, they did. So, could there have been something in the water? Yep, quite possibly. Uh, I mean, not so much in the water, but certainly drawn on his theory because I, I did. Mm mentioned it earlier on in the episode but never actually got around to talking about it but i briefly which kind of ties into justin's uh, theory um is i've read i've also read a lot of counter you know not arguments but accounts of similar sightings all with the same description but it goes down a, a more of a technology route so basically a lot of people have seen it said like you know a winged man you know metallic suit you know or black armor you know, giant wingspan doesn't flap, but they're you know propelled through the you know through the air, almost like a flight suit. Yeah. And there's been a lot of you know accounts and reports of governments and and whatnot trying to develop individual you know flight suits for Iron for soldiers. Man. Essentially, yeah, essentially, yeah, essentially Iron Man suits, but with but with wings, I guess. And so a lot of sightings of of I claimed it is then. <laughs> Exactly, a Vulcan is. <laughs> it's um, <still> a Marvel thing. <laughs> exactly, absolutely. Um, but no, but it's basically, yeah, like going down the whole route of the, the Falcon, you know, from, mm. from Marvel. It's that kind of, you know, winged suit to give man flight. And, you know, there's been accounts that I've seen back to the 1800s um, of, uh, of, of that type of thing happening, that like either inventors or, or governments or scientists trying to replicate the flight of a bird in a in a in a suit or contraption that men could wear to give them the same flight now for the most part it failed but you know with the things like roswell and everything else happening which i'm sure we'll come on to in, in later oh, episodes no doubt um you know did they did the american government find um you know technology or science that gave them the ability to then adequately make these types of winged suits because a lot of the accounts actually said that it was actually a man you know they saw a, a human face either in a helmet or you know in a, in a mask you know it was body armor you know a, a lot of them said it was like a flight suit so if you know if you imagine what you know sort of astronauts wear i guess you know you imagine an armored version of that 
with the giant wingspan. So, yeah, I think, yeah, obviously pointing out that, um, yeah, the CIA were in that area and that type of thing is possible, certainly based on accounts that, that I've read. That uh, that's a that's a good theory. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's I think it's very very, very good theory. Um, Absolutely. I, I'm very much on on the same sort of lines as John Keel, in the. I do believe there is a, a window area there um, mm. that some for some reason it, it crossed over with something. Mm. Um, I mean, the, the fact that a lot of the Mothman sightings culminated with um, UFO activity and yep. you know the regular activity you would see alongside UFOs. So there was things like um, animal mutilations as well. I mean, for instance, yep. it was Partridge. Uh, dog um, yeah. went missing. You know, mm-hmm. so that yeah. in itself was one of the accounts. We didn't really touch on animal mutilations that were no. being given credence to the Mothman as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I think it it tied in too much with the UFO thing, and I think we wanted to explore other avenues of explanation. Really. Yeah, because um, I think if you start talking about these types of things. And it, it, inevitably it will happen. But if you just come back to UFOs all the time, it, it starts to sound like you're giving it a certain spin and, and that's what you're trying to, you know, kind of force on on ourselves, but also, you know, hopefully the, the sort of the listeners and that's not the intention. We want to try and... If anything, we're trying to, to move away from that. Move away from it, to give other explanations and other yeah. theories as to what could be creating these these things. And yeah, like, like Justin's theory is, is bang on that, that, that type that's of thing. Plausible, isn't it? absolutely plausible understand the nature of lsd and, and what it does to the mind no exactly no i mean i've not i've not touched it for years so i, I can't it's <laughs> there you go you caught me there you go <laughs> <laughs> I, I hesitated a little bit what? Like, what? Ke? <laughs> <laughs> who is ke? who is this callum i do not know this go. one <laughs> but um but yeah we don't understand the 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 the, the, the what psychedelics can really do and what their purpose is i mean absolutely yeah i'm not going to go into psychedelics i mean we've, we've spoken about it on a personal level about yeah the, the idea of what psychedelics can do absolutely yeah psilocybin dmt lsd et cetera, yeah etc there is a possibility that the lsd opens up your mind to see these things we can only see a very small yeah. spectrum of light Maybe absolutely yeah it does allow you to see beyond infrared and ultraviolet mm. Maybe it allows it does allow you to see sound. Instead of diminishing your mind, does it open up your mind to use the other parts of it that we've not even tapped into yet as as a no, as a species? Know where yeah, comes from, mate. We really mm. don't. And I think the more we look into these various different high strangeness, because I think that's pretty much what we can call all of this. What we're yeah. investigating, that even the individual subjects themselves, they all come under the umbrella of high strangeness. I think the more Absolutely. we look into it, the more we're gonna. The, I think the more we're gonna understand what consciousness is. Yes, I believe. Or at so. least I hope we would, anyway. Yeah, I think it would only be inevitable. Maybe not with these, you know, initial, you know, sort of cryptids and and various encounters, but certainly with some of the other things that we're um, going to be touching on, um, we'll certainly get down to that that side of things more so in the ufo you know episodes that will surely follow i think that's where we'll we'll touch on that but um but no i think for the most part i think that's that's kind of my theory i think it's definitely something it's definitely as you said like a window or a a portal that was opened because it was for a a very specific amount of time and it's important to note that exactly and it's it's important to note that that since uh 19 the end of 1967 um, there hasn't been any real accounts of the Mothman in West Virginia, certainly to the level that it was, you know, during that 13 month um, sort of period. So was it a, a window that was open, you know, between that time where everyone was susceptible to seeing whatever was passing through it, whether it be planetary, interdimensional or, or whatever it is, something definitely happened in West Virginia during that time. And, you know, will we ever find out what it was? Was it like what Justin said and government testing, which is highly plausible? 
you know, was it was it a you know a, a sort of a paranormal window, as, uh, as as you know we both seem to sort of believe to a certain extent. You know, it's yeah. it lends itself to a, a number of it definitely. Things, it definitely isn't a creature. It's definitely it's something, not absolutely. Of any sort, because the dimensions don't add up. No, the it's definitely not a bird. Don't add up. Nothing like that. Adds up. It's nothing that we've seen. If it's a creature, it's definitely nothing that we're known that is known of on on this world. You know, as we. Uh, you know, as, as we know it. Um, but that's, yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, hopefully we've given a good account of, you know, the, the Mothman and its origins and, you know, and various encounters and, and hopefully the listeners will make up, as always, their own minds as to, you know, what side of the fence they uh, they sit on. And as always, we you know, we want to hear it. Do you agree with us? Do you think that it's just a fabrication? Do you agree with Justin in that it's government you know, related and, and how, you know, how and why do you, do you believe that any, yeah, any, any you know, evidence, send it in. Yeah. Cause we, we don't, we don't just finish on these, do we? No, exactly. Yeah. I'm still think, give us your theories. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. By all means, shout out to Justin. For giving yeah. Us cheers, man. Thank you very much. Agree on it. Cause I think it ties in very well with the Mothman stuff. Absolutely, it's the um, first theory as well that, that we've sort of had from a, yeah. a so listener. So to about injured cold. So yeah, I mean, be saying actually, a preemptive yeah. theory, a very well preemptive done theory. theory. Yeah, very well done. No, and, and I like it, and it's definitely, yeah, it definitely adds, uh, adds, you know, sort of supporting evidence to to that particular theory. And, and as we've said, it's definitely one that's plausible. But yeah, if this has encouraged anyone else to to get involved, then then please do drop us your theories or your opinions on on what it could be or or what the essence of the the mothman is and uh and and yeah and we'll we'll cl- gladly uh read them out in in future episodes but um speaking of future episodes um i suppose this is the time to announce what episode 4 is going to be about we we sort of mentioned them very vaguely earlier on in the uh in the episode um but do you want to do you want to do the honors <laughs> It is certainly going to be the weirdos that come a knocking. <laughs> be the men in black. <laughs> oh, not Jehovah's Witnesses then. Oh no, no, no. no. Oh, the other ones. Well, they also are in black, and and they come knocking. <laughs> and they are weirdos. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we're really sorry. <laughs> no, I don't mean it. I don't mean it. <laughs> On that note, it's uh, so goodbye from me. <laughs> goodbye from me.